Hello, my name's Matt Blair, and welcome to the last episode of the current series of Popcorn and Wine. Yes, that's right, this is somewhat of a season finale, and I'll admit, when I started making these videos, the intention was to do them weekly, forever. However, unfortunately, they just take too long to make, and I'm just one man, and it comes to the editing, the writing of the questions, the doing the music, all of those things, it just takes a long time to do, and in fact, it takes so long that I don't have time to see any movies, which makes this entire project a little bit counterproductive. I do have to say that these videos have been really fun to make. Meeting with my friends and just talking about our favorite movies has just been a blast. And there will be more episodes later this year. I'm already working on the next batch of episodes. But until then, let's get on with today's finale with Mitch Ben. Hello and welcome to Popcorn and Wine. My name's Matt Blair and joining me today, comedian, author, radio person and co-distraction clubber, Mitch Ben. <laughs> Hello, Matt. How's Hello, how you doing? Yeah, there's yeah, some, good, uh, good, there's good, some yeah. wine here. You can pretend to drink it if you I, like. I, I'll, I, yeah, I'll pretend to. I've got to drive to Norwich immediately. Yeah, yeah, he's got to drive. He's got to drive. Safety first. Safety first. Mitch, mm -hmm. what have you decided to uh, choose as your chosen subject? Let's talk about, well, I was going to say both Blade Runners. But technically, it should probably be all six Blade Runners. Isn't there? Gi given that there's at least five different versions of the first one. I read there's eight. Oh, right. I'm only aware of five. <laughs> <laughs> I that read there was eight is alternative that cuts. fan edits? Is that including... A, probably. Has anybody done it like that thing they did with the first Star Wars movie, where they sort of remake the whole thing one scene at a time? Do you know what? They probably have. Well, the original version is actually currently streaming on Sky Movies. Yes, it is. Which is amazing, yeah. because I bought the uh, five, discs, disc, five disc box set <laughs> Careful now. of it in 2007 when the final cut came out. Yeah. Not for the final cut, because it was the first time anybody had done a decent DVD yeah. transfer of the original, because as I'm sure we're going to get into, Blade Runner, I've, I've got a weird relationship with, with that mm. first movie, because I like it a lot, but I'm weirdly militant about which one. Because you, you are faithful to that original theatrical cut. Well, here's the thing, here's the thing. I am quite unusual, well, in many ways, but I'm unusual <laughs> uh, specifically because I actually went to see Blade Runner in its initial theatrical release mm. at the end of 1982. There you go. I was actually too young to get in to see it. I was 12 years old. It was <gasps> a double A certificate. You once. were naughty. Oh, yes, I was naughty, but I was big, so I got away with that. <laughs> there was never any plans for further cuts. The no, theatrical no, no, no. cut came out, yeah. but then someone found a reel, and they thought it was just the normal version. They had a screening, yeah. and it wasn't until during the screening they went, this is a completely different cut. I think that was the work print. Was that the, the discover the work yes, print? Yes, and it now, was released, though. They did release it yeah. as the director's cut. Yeah, which it wasn't. It was a work print. It's a rough cut. Yeah. I and mean, that was included in the, in, the, in, in the box set. And I have seen it, and its uh, principal difference is that it's a temp score. Right. It's not the Vangelis music. Right, right, and right. And that is astonishing how much that diminishes it. I saw that first movie when it came out. Mm -hmm. When it's it, and it... Absolutely blew my freaking mind. I'm not surprised. It blew, the editor just blew my mind. I'd mm. never seen anything. I mean, well, there hadn't been anything like it. Never mind, I hadn't seen anything. No, like sci fi it. noir just, was. Uh, sci fi noir, yeah. I mean, the thing is, you can. There is, it, it, it's like uh, a cultural watershed. What science fiction looks like, or certainly what depictions of the near future or the urban near future looks like, pivoted. Absolutely, at that moment. There is before Blade Runner and there is after Blade yeah. Runner. It's almost impossible now to do a future city sci-fi and not knock off Blade Runner. It's yeah. almost impossible. No, you know? of course. Um, one of the things I've often wondered is, because it really kind of went off like a damp squib when it came out in 82. Oh, yeah. It, 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 Rather it, like it, the one that came out this year. Well, there you go. Well, yeah, <laughs> funnily, we'll get on to that. You know? And again, it's, it's probably about as unjustified now as it was then, yeah. but kind of as, as, as understandable now yeah. as it was then. That, you know, This is not the movie that I think people thought it was going to be. It wasn't that it was marketed as anything other than what it was. I think people just made assumptions about what it's yeah. going to be. Comes out the year after Raiders of the Lost Ark. Harrison Ford is the biggest action star in the world. He's just done the first Indiana Jones movie and he's Han Solo. Yeah. Um, and so suddenly, oh, it's a sci-fi movie starring Harrison Ford. I think people thought it was going to be Indiana Jones and the Killer Robots. Yes. Um... And then you get into it and you actually discover that it's this weird, glacially slow... Really but slow. utterly immersive... Yeah. Gumshoe movie. It's sci-fi for like, grown-ups. It's, it's it is sci-fi for grown-ups, possibly more than any sci-fi movie mm. at that time since, like, 2001. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was on ITV the night before my physics O-level, <laughs> which if I was going to... Because I'm that old, it was O-levels, right? It was the second to last year of O-levels. It became GCSEs literally two years later. 
And if that was it, if I was going to fail any of them, that was the one, right? right? So my mum and dad got our first VCR because I was going to miss Blade Runner on oh, TV for so, the first so time. So you could record it. But what that meant was, having recorded oh. it, and then once my O-levels were, were over, I then had a VCR and literally one movie. So I think I watched Blade Runner about twice a day for the whole of the summer wow. of 1986. So when the director's cut came out in 92, the first thing I felt was sort I of... Director's cut. Director's cut. You know, <laughs> this is the first re-release in 1992 because 10 years later, with it having built up this massive cult following on mm. VHS, and, and of course the thing is, weirdly, it's a weird film to build up a following on VHS because you really don't get the benefit of that mm. movie if you want to know on VHS. Yeah. And you've got to remember, of course, in, 90, in the 80s, TVs were yay big. Well, they asked Ridley, Ridley was, he, he didn't want it released, this, right. this work print. He, yeah. he, he was like, no, no, that, I do not that, approve. Yeah, it's a rough I want to work yeah, on yeah, it, yeah. I want to work on it. But he couldn't finish it in time. Yeah. So they ended up releasing that director's, director's cut. cut. So yeah. he didn't yeah. approve that at all. So that's the fact that it's called yeah. director's cut is uh, he finds it a bit insulting. Yeah, and you I'm would. Sure. Yeah. I didn't actually like any of the changes that they've made. They don't advertise for killers in a newspaper. That was my profession. Ex cop. Ex blade runner. Ex killer. I understand why people don't like the voiceover. Bits Even Harrison it, Ford. Well, the fact that Harrison Ford didn't like it is one of the things that makes it work. Because the thing is, the voiceover, apparently when the film was previewed in 82, nobody understood a bloody word no. of it. Nobody could fathom what that. Even some of the crew. Even, Even some, some of the crew. I had literally no idea. You know, half of the dialogue's in this made-up language. Yeah. Um, city speak. City speak. You know, got to talk. Stylistically, I think the voiceover kind of works. There were some terrible bloody lines in it, mm. to be honest. Deckard was going to go around wearing a fedora until he was cast as Harrison Ford. Yeah. And in all the production <laughs> drawings, Deckard's got a big 1940s mm -hmm. private detective hat on, but then, of course, Harrison Ford in a fedora is Indiana Jones. It's a bit easy to dismiss the voiceover as superfluous now that we've all had the benefit of it. My trouble is, if I watch either the director's cut or the final cut, I just dub it back in in my head. Therefore, you know what I mean? So w um, out of all the cuts that are out and available, if they released a podcast <coughs> of just the narration, you could you listen to it? it? Well, it's, it's, it's pointless. I just do it in my head anyway. <laughs> I know the 82 cuts so well. The other two big changes are the unicorn sequence yeah. and cutting off the happy ending. Right? Right? And I'm going to get... Now, the thing is, I've done this at length. I mean, we can put a link into a, a, a big article I wrote once. We yeah, 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 all, yeah. All of this. Why I'm, I'm not happy about either of those two changes either. Mm. First of all, I hate the unicorn sequence mm. because it's meant to be a dream sequence, but it doesn't look like a dream sequence. It looks like what it is, which is a bit of test footage from legend haphazardly faded in and out at a random point in the movie. This insert of the unicorn sequence is basically to set up the whole is Decker replicant thing, which is a really dumb idea. The movie implies, the whole point is, you know, the whole character arc of Rachel implies that, yeah, by definition, anybody could be a replicant. Mm. That's there already, right? Yeah. Without setting up the idea that Deckard in particular is a replicant. But setting up the idea that Deckard in particular is a replicant is bad for two reasons. One, doesn't work as a plot device. If you're going to make a replicant to yeah. hunt other replicants, then either you do what they eventually do with Officer K... Yeah which is program him to be unswervingly faithful in his duty and pump him up so that he can punch through walls, mm -hmm. right? Or if you, for some reason, deemed it necessary to program his head so that he thinks he's a human cop, mm. why do you let him be disenchanted and reluctant to do the whole thing? Why don't you make him like Charles Bronson in Death Wish? Why don't you give him some backstory where his wife and kids were murdered by replicants and now he's yeah. out for vengeance against all replicants? I mean, that could have been a good plot twist when, you know, at the end you reveal that his wife and kids never existed and he's just been programmed to spend his entire life in sorrow and hatred. That yeah. would have been quite a neat plot twist. It, it, see, this is the trouble. It's because it's bolted on. It's not there in the original movie. This is a bolted-on plot twist. Why would you make an android to think it's a cop, an, an android-hunting cop and then make it A, reluctant to do it, and B, physically incapable of doing it. Every time Decker comes up against one of the replicants, he gets his ass kicked. He does. Secondly, it guts the movie thematically. Yeah. Right? Because for me, what that film is about, it's about humanity. right? It's about what counts, and this is very much brought up in the second movie, what counts as humanity. If you build a machine which is inwardly human and believes itself to be human, have you basically made a human? And does the fact that it's technically not human still give you the right to switch it off without committing murder? That's the point. Yeah. Are these things alive or are they machines that think they're alive? It's the measure of a man from Star Trek Next Generation. Exactly. Yeah, so there you go. Is, it, yeah, are they the one where, is that the one where Data's put on 
trial to prove that he basically yeah. has uh, an in real existence. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I love about Blade Runner, yeah. it's only when you see it four or five times, you realise that you're actually on the wrong side. Yeah. And that Deckard is not the hero, he's the protagonist. Mm. Roy's the hero. Yeah. Gosh, you really got some nice toys here. Roy is bursting with life. Mm. That's the point. He is a machine, but he is bursting with life and humanity. He is passionate. He's crazy in love with his girlfriend. He quotes yeah. poetry. He, you know, he plays chess. He cracks jokes. Yeah. He pulls funny faces. He's bursting with life and energy. And he just wants to be a real boy. You know, yeah. he wants to be human. Philip K. Dick unfortunately died before yeah, it before came, it came out. out. Yeah, yeah. He did see the opening 20 minutes. Yeah. And he was really pleased with the opening yeah. 20 minutes. But he never got to uh, see the completed film. Uh, but when he saw an early screenplay, it was a guy called Herb Jaff and his son. Right. Uh, and he hated that script right. so much. He turned up and he, was, he basically said to him at the airport, he says, do you want me to beat you up here at the airport or do you want me to wait until we get to the apartment? <laughs> he, he hated it so That's much. That's the kind of guy Philip K. Dick was. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it went through so many iterations yeah. and about four or five different Since titles. the early 70s, it was going yeah, through yeah, yeah, screenplays. Yeah, 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 exactly. It was, it, because people were interested because it was, it came out 68, I think, Something the book. Like that, yeah, yeah. And people were already, as soon as they read it, they were like, this, this would be a great film, this would be a yeah. great film. I think they also had in mind films like Metropolis. Yeah. Eventually it did get made and he loved the casting of... Yeah. Uh, uh, of um, no, Rutger Hauer. Oh, yeah. He was just like the perfect, cold, calculated, uh, and He's, he was Aryan yeah. as well. Well, I mean, he looks like somebody who's been designed in a lab to be yeah. unstoppable. Ridley Scott. Yeah. This was his first film working in America. Yeah. And so, the American crew hated him. Yes, yeah, they yeah, really did. Yeah. What he likes to do, he likes to get behind the camera. He likes mm. to be able to set the shot up himself, yeah. see how it's looking. American crews do not like that. No. They really, they, they found they him this overbearing. Of labor thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. also what he likes to do is going, mm, let's change the set around and let's reblock this and let's rewrite this. Mm. And again, American crews weren't used to that sort of yeah. way of doing things. What eventually happened, there was a bit of the thing called T-shirt wars. Oh, yeah, yeah. You hear about the yeah, T-shirt wars? The t so yeah. all the crew would wear T-shirts saying, yes, governor, my ass. ass. Yes, yes. Yeah. And he would wear a T-shirt saying, uh, xenophobes suck, or something yeah, like yeah, that. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> this feels like a film that's the product of a problematic shoot. Yeah. It does. And that doesn't necessarily mean a bad movie, by the no, way. No, 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 not at all. No. It's just if in, anything, just you can the really DC, add to it. Just in the DC universe, it means a bad movie. Right? <laughs> you know. um, Blade Runner 2049. Right, here's the thing. I was really worried when Blade Runner 2049 was announced, partly because it was yeah. announced just after Prometheus came out. So, oh, great. Mm. So I've watched Ridley shit over half of his sci-fi legacy. Now do I have to sit over and watch him shit over the other bit, yeah. which is really personal to me. Mm. Blade Runner... It's my favourite movie ever, so it's just, I, can we please not watch this getting shat on? I was so panicked about this that about a month before it came out, I wrote and posted on my Patreon page, we'll talk all about my Patreon page in due course, I wrote and recorded on my Patreon page a song called, we can swear on this, can't we? We can swear. A song called Don't Fuck Up, the sequel to Blade Runner, right? And then immediately I wrote this song and posted it, and I thought, I need to do a video. I've got to do a video for this song. But now it was like two weeks before the release of 2049, right? So I called my friend Angela Curiello, who's a great photographer and had just done some headshots for me. I said, Ange, do you think you can Ridley Scott my living room? Don't fuck up the sequel to Blade Runner. I don't know why we need a sequel to Blade Runner, but if you've got to do a sequel to Blade Runner, try to do a decent sequel to Blade Runner. Why is Ryan Gosling in there? Stay true to the look, 
stay true to the themes. Don't shit on my childhood and make trick dreams. There's just one thing that you got to do. Think aliens, not Highland the two. Got to introduce you to my friend here. Um, this is a water pistol. Like, I've <laughs> always wanted a copy of the blade. In the script, it's referred to as a PKD blast on. I never knew what PKD stood for. It stands for Philip K. Dick. Of course, uh, it does. they named the gun after the after the author. Um, <laughs> this is a water pistol. This they, they this this came out about a month before I made this video, and I was in the comic book store called Ray Gun, oddly enough, yeah. in Richmond, um, and they had a bag of these things imported from Japan for about twenty five quid each. Mm. Which is not bad, considering that you know replica Blade Runner pistols on eBay usually go for a couple hundred. You yeah, know what I mean, yeah, yeah. I thought, but I, I cannot possibly justify buying that. <laughs> I want that so bad, but I cannot possibly justify buying a chuffing water pistol just because it looks like Deckard's gun. And then when I decided to make this, I thought I can buy the water pistol. You can justify. I've of got course. the perfect excuse to buy that. So when I buy and then it's thing, tax deductible as well. <laughs> uh, I, I, when I went and bought the thing. And of course, in its initial form, it's translucent. The handle is still translucent, but I left it translucent because the handle on the original is kind of made of amber, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I just got model paint and sprayed up the thing, you know, uh, dusty black and put these bits of silver detail in it. What I hadn't had time to do is put the LEDs in. Of course, Deckard's gun, famously, for no reason whatsoever, has two little LEDs. It's the future. There. Everything has lights it, on it. It was the 80s and the future had <laughs> LEDs on, yeah. Even the umbrellas yeah. had lights on. Yeah. So I finished it with that, put it up a bit, and then the most wonderful thing happened. Michael Green the co-screenwriter with Hampton Fancher yep. of Blade Runner 2049, replied to this in a rather forlorn manner, going, well, well, well I, I, I don't think we did fuck it up. <laughs> and I replied to him and said, well, I'm seeing it on Thursday, I'll let you know. And he said, can we have another song if we didn't fuck it up? And I went, <laughs> OK. <laughs> so. Subscribe to my Patreon first. Subscribe to my Patreon first, <laughs> Pick me up to all your movie producers, you know, <laughs> you know. Yeah, if I send you copies of my book that you can sort of wave at Ridley Scott the next time you see. <laughs> they didn't fuck up the sequel to Blade Runner. They really didn't fuck up the sequel to Blade Runner. The spits will scream, the spits will cry. It's nearly three hours, but it zips right by. The visuals and design are incredibly impressive, and if Ryan Gosling isn't very expressive, that's perfect for his character. Written on the page, and there's a couple of bits where he goes for Nick Cage. Go, go. <laughs> it's so bloody good. The sequel to Blade Runner, you gotta go see the sequel to Blade Runner. And if it might seem like I'm overreacting, Harrison Ford actually gets to do acting. It doesn't do anything. I hope that it wouldn't. And the score is not Bangalis, but it's still a good. And it's better than we dared hope would deserve. You've done a man's job, sir, Denny Villeneuve. Let's talk about the movie. And let's then, talk yeah, about, let's talk about the movie. Cause and why they didn't fuck it up. They really didn't. They really didn't. They really didn't. Because the here, here's my on. thing. Because right. I, I think Blade Runner is a good movie. Right. That doesn't necessarily mean I like it. <laughs> <laughs> that's an important distinction. Yeah, yeah, that's an important distinction. It is a good movie. It's well made. The music's great. It's great performances. Yeah. But to me... It just edges a little bit too much on the side of boring. However, <laughs> however, yes. that's what I think a lot of good sci-fi for grown-ups is. Yeah, yeah. Like even Tron. Like I like Tron. Yeah, but, but it's hard I, work that first. It, one. it really yeah, is. It, it, it really yeah. is. I liked 2049. It has all the same things, but yeah. there's something about it that I just liked. It's how late Harrison Ford comes into it, but when he comes in. He gives it his all. Harrison Ford does more acting in Blade Runner 2049 than he's basically done in the last 30 years of his career. Really? Ryan Gosling does a lot of the Ryan Gosling thing. You know? mm -hmm. There are all kinds of basically insurmountable ob obstacles mm. to doing Seal of Blade. Now, the first one we've alluded to is that we've caught up with Blade Runner. Yeah. It's a movie set in the future which isn't the future anymore. No. Right? It's set, and it's set in a very, very different future one began. Now, the thing is... This is not something that people should ever hold against science fiction. Science fiction is not predictive, it's speculative. Yeah. Ryan, uh, Ridley and Hampton Fancher and David Peoples were not coming up with a concrete prediction of what the world was going to be like in 2019. No. Yeah. It was an imaginary 2019. Now, That's why Star Trek got away with it so well, by saying it's 300 it's years in the future. future you know, yeah. <laughs> so obviously, there are things which not only have not happened, which are not going to happen in the course of the next 18 months, yeah. which, are, <laughs> which are going to make Blade Runner in any way represent mm. the reality of life in November. 
for 2019. Yeah. We are not going to establish colonies on other planets. We are not going to invent flying cars, and we are not going to have, uh, you know, artificial people. We we have artificial people, but they're not used for off-world or dangerous labour. They no, are used yeah, for something yeah, a little exactly. bit more saucy. Bit, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, that's, well, that's, <laughs> that that is touched upon in both movies. Oh, yeah, 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 Pris. Uh, you know, yeah, well, Pris is basically a sex bot, and yeah. the Mackenzie Davis character, the dude, who's very brilliantly cast because she looks just enough like Daryl Hannah, you think that, yeah, she's the 30 years later model. The first thing they do, and this is, again, kind of hinted at in the trailer when you see the big whacking great Atari logo, yeah. is that, all right, first Blade Runner now takes place in an alternate present. Yeah. It doesn't take place in the future anymore, and this new Blade Runner takes place 30 years after that. Second thing I was really dreading they were going to do is... Uh, answer one way or the other yes. whether or not Deckard's are replicants. Because for my money, in my appreciation of Blade Runner, there are two different versions of that story yeah. that you can choose to take or leave as suits you. There is a version of the story in which Deckard is definitely human. There is a version of the story in which Deckard is probably not human. Mm -hmm. That's why I like the 82 theatrical cut better. Yeah. for all the reasons I've explained it in order mm -hmm, length. Mm -hmm. Now, what I was worried about is if they solve this conundrum definitively one way or the other, one of those versions of the story then becomes invalid. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And has yeah. been essentially been overwritten. Yeah. Right? And I was very worried that obviously it's going to be the one that I like, seeing as I appear to be in a tiny minority <laughs> in that I like the 82 theatrical cut and I don't think Deckard's a replicant. Mm. We have, that appears to be definitely the minority opinion about it, including Ridley, who, while not directing, was exec producing. Mm. You know what I mean? So I he, wa he was going to direct twenty forty nine, yeah. and I think if he had, they probably would have answered it definitively. Yeah. Whereas so I think what we got they lucky. what they did was ingenious, which is mm. address it. And not resolve it. It um, didn't get Van Gelis back, though. Didn't yeah. get Van Gelis back, but, but... And that was one of the things, again, that I was worried about. Particularly when you get Hans Zimmer. Because Hans mm. Zimmer, for my mind, he has his moments, but I think he can be a bit overrated, and he does reuse a lot of his ideas. So I was thinking, oh, seriously, Hans Zimmer? says him. But, but it turns out that the reason they got Hans Zimmer to bring in Benjamin Valfish yeah. is that the original score wasn't Van Gelis enough. Right. They actually said, no, nah, this wants to be more Vangelis. Yeah. Hans, can you do Vangelis? And he said, well, I can't, but Benjamin can. One of the things about Vangelis' mm. score is people think of it as being, oh, it's very sort of, you know, icy and frosty and certain. It's actually, it's not. It's quite camp, Vangelis' oh, yeah. score. It's big and swooning and romantic, you know what I mean? Um, it's it's, it's high-end porno music. Oh, it kind of is, yeah, but, but, but really good high-end porno music. This is like the Van Gelis score, but with a lot of the sort of more lush and romantic elements stripped out, which is good because this, if anything, is set in an even more depressing world than Blade Runner yeah. was. Radioactive Vegas, yeah. uh, which is the most visually amazing bit. You know, so... It, 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 orange is, oh, it's gorgeous. It's, it's gorgeous. beautiful There's a guy silhouettes. called Ian Dunt who does the Romaniacs podcast, who I did, and he posted yeah. something very funny before Christmas. Do you remember that day before Christmas when the sky went yellow? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so basically, we got the Sahara Desert sands yeah, yeah, in the sky. Yeah, the sky went bright yellow for mm -hmm. like a whole day. Mm -hmm. And Ian Dunt posted on Twitter and said, my mate's just come out of an afternoon screening of 2049 and see this. <laughs> Can you imagine the state of it? Uh, <laughs> The relationship between Kay and Joy uh, is worth the whole movie in itself. Wonderful relationship. It's worth the whole movie in itself. The idea of these 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 two artificial people who are madly in love with each other and neither yeah. one of them's real. You know? But what I also like is because people were saying, you know, or oh, was it really necessary for her to be so hypersexualized in all the adverts? I mean, well, oh, yeah. Because that's when you realise what she actually is. Because yeah. for the first half of me, you think, ah, she's Alexa. She's the 2049 version yes. of Alexa. Yeah, then exactly. you go, no, she's not, she's Pornhub. Yeah. She's just porn. But I like the way she rotates all her different looks. Yeah. But the one he likes is kind of action chick. Yeah. Sort of her <laughs> default setting is kind of, you know, the big baggy trousers and the messy top knot and the vest. Mm. You know, his, obviously his favourite look for his slightly kind of Lara Crofty action chick. That's yeah. how he likes her to be. You know what I mean? Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. It's, uh, no, it's, it's adorable. And that, you know, and then it makes it all the more tragic that not only does she get deleted... But now, not only is he going to be forever, forever haunted by 3D images of her, he's yeah. going to be forever haunted over by 3D images of porn star her. You know, which it's is a sort black of... Black Mirror. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, it's totally Black Mirror. You know yeah, what yeah. I mean? 
Yeah, it, that in and of itself would have made a good Black Mirror. Just the relationship yeah. between the two of them would have made it a really good Black Mirror. You've well, got questions. I've got a quiz for you now. I've questions. got a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> this is an avoid camp test. So don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> should have got one. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I brought a gun. He should have brought the avoid camp to <laughs> Question one. Yes. If you saw a tortoise in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> tortoise, what's that? Do you know a turtle? Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> like one of those. Anyway. I've never seen a turtle. <laughs> Well, I understand what you mean. Is this okay. part of the test now? Sorry. <laughs> All right, OK. Parody's over. Parody's over. The real shit begins now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey! <laughs> Mitch shot first. Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Question one. Yes. The story came, uh, mm -hmm. the first uh, uh, Blade Runner, the story mm -hmm. came from a Philip K. Dick book, but yeah. who wrote the book where they got the title? Oh, oh wait, 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 wait. Oh, oh, Naked Lunch Guy. Uh, William Burroughs. Ah, no. no. He wrote the novella, oh, you which was it, which yeah. was the basis for right. a movie that was based on the book The Blade Runner by Alan Norse. Oh, yes, I did know that for some reason. But I got William Burroughs just over it. But, yeah, no, he yeah. wrote a treatment for the movie, yeah. which was Blade Runner, yeah. the movie, which is, gotcha. that's what William that S. Burroughs did. my confusion. Jared Leto. Yes. Was not Denis Villeneuve's first choice for Wallace. Yeah. Who was? David Bowie. Yes. I had we have a point, that. yes. Yeah, but he's too ill. He died, yeah. 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 Sad. Yeah. What is the number on Deckard's police badge? Son of a bitch. <laughs> I don't know that, but you know, had I actually revised for that, that's the kind of thing I would have known. Is it on his gun? <laughs> <laughs> No, it's not. I don't know. Uh, yeah. It's uh, B26, uh, B26354. He reads it out twice. He reads mm. it at the Zora crime There's a shot of it, I think, yeah, as well. Yeah, and then he also, I think, holds it up to the car phone when he's yeah. in front of Sebastian in the Bradbury. When Gaff arrests Deckard at the beginning mm -hmm. and they get in the car and there's an, a, an alert on the monitor for a purge, yeah. which film used that same monitor as a prop? That's uh, from Alien. It is. And, it and is. the graphic of Purge is the graphic of the Nostromo and Dominic, yeah. so they actually use that bit of, um, it's pretty cool. A bit of animation again. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. cool. Okay, next question. Where was most of Blade Runner 2049 filmed? Oh, God, I don't know. Um, is, it like, is it Australia? Is no. Australia? Budapest. Budapest. Yeah, I think I had heard that. Most, yeah. most of it, not all, but most of it was filmed in Budapest. Budapest. Yeah. Next question. Agent K in Blade Runner 2049 yes. lives in a building that goes by which name? I didn't notice. I know it says uh, fuck off Skinner on his, front, on his, on his door. <laughs> Uh, I didn't notice the name of his building. Uh, Mobius 21. Yes, named after the comic book artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There yeah. you go. Okay, this is a sort of an interesting, fun one. What yeah. did Harrison Ford do? Because it was, it was well known that Harrison Ford and Sean Young didn't hugely get no, on. I mean, Harrison Ford didn't get on with anyone really anyone, on that no, film. Yeah, yeah. He didn't really enjoy making that film. No, he didn't. It's amazing they yeah. got him back, actually. It yeah. really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, during their rough sex scene, yeah. he, he upset her quite a bit. So what did he do to lighten the mood? This is a story I've not heard. Do tell. He mooned her. Ha <laughs> ha, what the hell not? He, he, yeah. he was uh, notorious for it. <laughs> Carrie Fisher talked fondly of the fact that he would uh, moon the, uh, the crew on Star Wars movies because uh, they were always uptight Brits. Let's face it, that was probably an epic <laughs> ass. He was probably quite proud of it back then. Yeah. <laughs> Ridley Scott, for the first Blade Runner, dedicated the film to his brother who had died. Uh, what was his brother's name? Not Tony. Not Tony, no. Because no. Tony died, didn't Yeah, he? no, he's not had much luck with brothers. I don't know. This is another one. Yeah. Uh, where's, it, where's it dedicated? Is it, is it not the end credits? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah it's, it's just it's dedicated to his brother Frank. I had seen that, but I didn't know that was who it was. Yeah. What breed of dog does Deckard have in 2049? Well, he looks like a sort of black Alsatian. Is he an Alsatian? It's not an Alsatian. What is he? It's an Estrella Mountain Dog. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jared Leto is the sole Oscar winner in that movie, but yeah. how many other nominees of the Oscars are there? Are there two, three, or four well, nominees? Let's see. Roger Deakins, who was the DP. No, no, is... no, as the actor. Sorry. Oh, as right, actors, I was going to say, sorry, sorry, he's sorry. famous for being nominated and not winning. Yeah. He gets nominated <laughs> all the time and never wins. Oscar winners. Two, three, or four other actors. Who are Oscar winners. Oscar nominees. Oscar nominees. Because Leto is the only winner. I'm going to say two. Ah, uh, it's four. Son of a bitch. It's four. Ryan Who's Gosling. It? Yeah. Harrison Ford. Yeah. Edward James Olmos has been nominated for an Oscar. When was Edward James Olmos nominated? Uh, we'll look it up, but he has been nominated for an Oscar. That genuinely surprised me. Uh, and also Barker Abdi. No disrespect for Edward James Olmos, but that no. genuinely surprised me. And Barker Abdi, who was uh, the guy in Captain Phillips. Oh, balls, yes! <laughs> that is it, so. Oh, that was wonderful. Two points. That's, two that's points. Appalling. I'm so, I'm so. You are, you so are tied annoyed. with Rhea Lena at I'm the bottom. I'm so annoyed. I'm so annoyed. Anyway. Uh, well, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I but. Suck. You know, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> so what other films do you want to talk about? What other films have you been really enjoying? Oh, well, let's see. I mean, at some point, but, oh, I don't get to the movies nearly often enough these no, days. No, no. Not since I had kids. I get to see a lot of Pixar movies. I took the kiss scene by Panther. Ah, yes. Uh, but I was going to go see that one way or the other. Yeah. But, you know. yeah, I love Shape of Water. I mean, I liked it more than you, but I think mm. I had a weird advantage Shape of Water. I got to see a preview screening of it about two months before it came out. And I went into it knowing literally nothing. See, I would have benefited from that. Yeah, all I, I think I would have all I knew was that. the title that Sally was in it mm. and Guillermo del Toro was directing. That yeah. was literally all I knew. I didn't even know there was a monster in it until <laughs> something went thunk against that glass yeah, tank. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even know that. Was, never mind that she was going to end up shagging it. I, had no, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know that there was even a monster in it. What films are you looking forward to Ooh. this year? What's coming out this year? What's coming I'm out this year? I mean, we've got drift, to be honest. we've got Avengers: Infinity War. Oh God, yeah! The trailer was the best trailer I'd ever seen. It just made you ache to see the damn film without telling you a damn thing about it. You might be looking forward to Solo. Solo, yeah, I am looking forward to Solo. Um, the trailer's good. Alden Ehrenreich looks right. He sounds wrong. Doesn't have Harrison Ford's voice, and that's going to take it's, a bit of getting used to. It's it's a child. No child sounds like the grown up self. And even I guess. the voice thing, I, yeah. can, I can I can I can I can I'll get used deal to it. with it. I'll I get used with to it. it. Like Chris Pine as Kirk, he doesn't do a Kirk. He voice. does just enough. Every now and again, do you reckon? He, every now and again, he throws in a bit of Shatner. Just mm. every now and Maybe. again. Maybe. Certainly Maybe. in the first movie. Thank you, mate. Thank you, Mitch, for as joining ever. us today. Yeah. Uh, is there anything? March the 6th, me, this guy, and this guy's dad. If you're in London, March 6th, Distraction Club. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it'll um, be a couple of days after this goes out. This will be it's, out, yeah. It's, 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 it's our thing. It's our thing. It's our thing. And, uh, the event, the link is going to be in the description below. Interlinked. If you've never been to, um, if, if, if you've never been to the Distraction Club before, A, why the not, but seriously, um, first Tuesday of every month at the Phoenix Pub in Cavendish Square mm -hmm. in London. Oxford um, Circus. Near Oxford Circus. Um, if, if, if you any first Tuesday of the month, come on down. It's the night just for the musical comedians. If, that's, if I'm anything, I'm a musical, I'm a comic songwriter. And, and we put this together basically so we could get to work with all the other musical comics because they keep us apart on the circuit. If you see this before then, do come down to the club. Come along, six. come along. It's and if you see it fun. after then, come down the first Tuesday of yeah. any month because it's a riot. Anything again you want to plug on top of that? Uh, well, uh, yeah, my tour is up and running. The I'm Still Here tour. The dates are at mitchben.com slash gigs. Uh, if you are aware of what I do and you would like to help me carry on doing it, then please consider going to my Patreon page. We'll put a link in there. Yeah, yeah, we'll yeah. put a link in there. Please yeah. consider going to my Patreon page. You can uh, sort of help me do this and also really collaborate with me on things. Uh, and it could cost you as little as 12 bucks a year. It's bucks, it's an American sign. Um, and, 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 and buy Matt a coffee. Please buy me a coffee. Um, and um, <laughs> do buy me a coffee. And buy uh, me a coffee. And subscribe. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Subscribe to Matt's YouTube channel All because links. this is the future, folks. Yeah. You know, this is the only way we're going to be able to do this from now on. It's the only way we can keep body and soul together. You um, know, when people say, "Why are you on, on TV? Life, not living at, oh, I'm on yeah. YouTube." Yeah. <laughs> that, that's as close as I can get. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's called. That's what's known as grandma career advice. <laughs> well, you should go on that live at the Apollo. Go on that, you'd be good on that. <laughs> Go on that live with the Apollo. You know, why do you get a job? Why do you get a job on EastEnders? You'd be good on that. Do that. Go on EastEnders. Yeah. It's called Grandma Career Advice, is what it's called. Support Matt. Support me. Support Mitch. Support the stuff you like. And you got children to feed. I got children to feed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and what I end up feeding them to could be down to you. So yeah. <laughs> Well, thanks again for joining us. Buddy. This has been uh, Popcorn and Wine. I've been Matt Blair. That's been Mitch Ben. We'll see you again uh, next time. That's the end of the series. So bye-bye. Interlinked. Thank you once again to Mitch Ben for joining us today on Popcorn and Wine. As we just mentioned, please go to the description below for all the contact details in terms of social media, Mitch's Patreon page, his gig listing on his website. Find him there on all of those things and with all of my stuff below, the Twitter, the Instagram, the Facebook page, that's all in the description below as well. I do want to give a big thanks to all the guests that I've had on this series of Popcorn and Wine. That's Jay Foreman, Ria Lena, Rick Carranza, Doug Siegel, Pippa Evans and of course again Mitch Ben. 
Thank you so much, all of you, for joining. And thank you all for watching and all the new subscribers. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, please hit the button below. And if you like what you see, there are also other reviews that I've been doing. There'll be more spoiler talk. There'll be lots more content coming soon. We'll see you again for the next series of Popcorn and Wine. That'll be in a few months' time. But until then, my name's Matt Blair. I'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching.